Hi, my name is uh, Marco Tischler. I'm, I work for Aerohive Networks, and uh, I'm a big fan of network programmability. Uh, I would like to talk about SDN uh, and how it affects our Wi-Fi industry. Now, first of all, how many of you have heard about SDN? Everybody's heard of SDN. How many of you have deployed a software-defined network? Right. How many of you are 100% confident that you know what SDN is? <laughs> right. That, that's what I expected. So uh, I would like to take this presentation to describe what can it do and what's the marketing fed, or at least what, in my view, it can do and what is the marketing fed. I'd like to talk about, so let's first have a common definition of what the hell is this. Then talk about the architecture, the different types of SDN, the relationship between SDN and Wi-Fi and which problems can it solve, which problems it's not even either possible or smart to solve, and what are the examples uh, out there. Now, first of all, um, the answer to the question to what is SDN, this is the answer. So it's the wild, wild west. Uh, it can be anything, and people claiming it's uh, one thing, then you have another vendor claiming it's another, then you have your Deutsche Telekoms and AT&Ts out there claiming it's something completely different, and one way or another, everybody's marketing everything as SDN now, right? And um, that's not a good thing for uh, an engineering community. We, li we like to have our things defined, we like uh, to have our standards, we like to have our protocols, so this is not very good for a networking world. Notice the word software. Didn't we have software in networking since forever? So where is software in networking? It's on every network device. There's an operating system in there. Um, there may be some applications running on top of the network equipment. So is this SDN? If it is, then we've had it since the beginning. What about scripting? How many of you are fans of Perl? No? Python? <laughs> okay, so uh, Perl scripting. Uh, I'm sure you've, during your career, career, you've written some scripts to help with your network management, to help with your uh, device configuration. So basically, it's a piece of code or piece, a piece of software touching your devices and telling them to do something, instead of you logging into the CLI and doing something. Is this SDN? Yes, no, we're not sure. We've also had this for quite a while. Let's take a step back. What's the problem, or what we think is the problem with the current state of networking? Uh, and I would state that there are two sets of problems. There are the problems that are, that are in the world of AT&Ts, Googles, Amazons, uh, Deutsche Telekom, so the big guys that either have big data centers, that have big international networks, large, backbones and things like that. And then there's the rest of us, so the small guys. Uh, but generally, the problem is that if you compare the networking world to the way software development is done, it's pretty rigid. It's complicated, everything's all over the place, and if you take into account how long does it take to introduce a new service, so, or design, develop, and implement a new service, that can take a very, very long time, especially if you're dependent on the vendor to implement it for you. So you have this brilliant idea that my RRM algorithms on my campus Wi-Fi are bad, and you go to the vendor and say, hey, Mr. Vendor, please develop a new RRM algorithm just for me. What's, what's gonna be the answer? <laughs> oh, that's one of the answers. Um, the other one is, Maybe, but how long will it take? Mm, show me the money, right? So are you able to do that yourself? To some extent, you, you can do that with Perl scripting, but that's prone to errors. Uh, who's going to maintain that? Uh, does the network equipment actually support any kind of 
interface other than CLI? So those are the questions. And uh, as a result of all this mess, our networks have become hard to manage. The larger they get, the more services they support, the harder they are to manage. And the harder it is to uh, introduce a new service. By the way, what's the most popular answer to any question that you asked of the IT personnel? No. No is the answer. Yeah. So uh, the solution to this problem is to have abstractions, so to, have, to add another abstraction layer. I'm sure you've heard of this before, right? In networking, we have so many abstractions. Uh, how well is the TCP IP abstraction for applications so far, historically? So, so, so. Some say it's broken. Um, what SDM proposes is, let's add another abstraction and deal the network as a whole. So let's program the network and don't deal with whatever is lying underneath. Sounds like a recipe for a disaster, but let's go on. Uh, the, the ultimate goal is, let's make our networks more evolvable. So uh, let's take the power of implementing our own services and make this faster. Not wait for the vendors to come up with new algorithms and new solutions uh, for a year or two. And uh, in my opinion, this is a definition of SDN. So it's the abstraction layer that enables rapid service development that is independent of the underlying, often complex network infrastructure. Where does it all come from? It comes from the big guys, Googles, Amazons. Uh, it comes from large data centers. It comes from uh, international transport networks. It comes from backbones, so huge stuff. Not the edge, not the access network. And uh, most popular cases where SDN was uh, actually needed, uh, one is VLAN management in a huge data center environment, which becomes a nightmare to manage. Uh, you have VMs popping up, popping down, uh, going from one data center to another, going from one host to another. Oh, too dynamic. Um, the other one is from the old telco environments where you have OSSs uh, and BS, so operational support system, business support systems. It's not that they can't cope with the complexity, the problem is that they're really, really pricey. And an upgrade for a new device type in that kind of a system will require a development of an adapter, which costs money, then you'll have to buy an adapter license, and then you'll have to buy the support for that adapter. Then multiply that, let's say, how, how often do you change equipment? Every five years? So you're in the business for 15 years, you had 30 different boxes in there, and that's a lot of money. Okay, so that's why SDN became popular for, for OSS, BSS environment. And the third one is backbone networks, where you want to manage everything as uh, a fabric. It should be very simple. Here's the Google's example. So Google uses SDN for traffic engineering, for improved routing, and improved monitoring. Um, by the way, I have to thank Gregor for this spot because it follows the QoS discussions. Um, you, it follows the IoT discussion that David had in the morning, and I think it fits in perfectly. We want to ha so Google wanted to have a better topology of our awareness, to have faster convergence. If one link goes down, the traffic should go somewhere else with minimum uh, downtime with minimum loss and so on. Um, do you see anything, this, any of this applicable to Wi-Fi? To access at all? Not yet. I don't, at least. Um, again, we're engineers, we like to define things. This is the general architecture of SDN and this has been accepted across, uh, across the industry. So we have three layers. We have our devices running our uh, just throwing packets around. We have our control plane, which is currently distributed between devices and in the protocol, so our internet, uh, BGP routing protocol, and so on. Uh, we also, we call the component in here the network operating system, and it should be decoupled from the actual devices. And then in the top layer, we have a control program, which is the application. An application could be a load, bar load balancer application, a firewall application, or something you just came up with, your own whatever. 
And the main principles are we need to have a single view of the network. So we only have, uh, we have a global view. There is, there is one single of interpretation of the network state. There's not many interpretations, like when you have monitoring systems today. There's one monitoring system er saying everything is green, then you have the second monitoring system saying everything is down, and they're looking at the same network. Is this a single view of the network? Not really. So we want to have a single view. Uh, we require programming interfaces and require a single point of interface. So we're, we don't want to go to every individual device and uh, configure it. And the most important thing for SDN is the, it's, its architecture. Okay? So we write our apps here. We interface the network, and we don't deal with the boxes down there. Uh, how many of you have heard about separation of control and data plane? Uh, how many of you know how that works? OK, OpenFlow? Any, anyone tried OpenFlow? Yeah, I see some people not, uh, not being happy about this. So um, what we want to achieve? Rapid service and application development. That's our main goal. Uh, we also need open programming interfaces, so not some proprietary adapters that we have to pay our money for, that nobody really knows how they work. We need open interfaces. We need separation of control from, control from data forwarding. Uh, this is uh, the trickiest one, because what, so where is the control plane? Okay, it's, this, it's, uh, logic, it's separate, uh, but how? Is it physically centralized? Is it logically centralized? Will you have one open flow controller? Will there be many of them? What are the implications? So the idea is that the control plane, whatever it is, translates between service or application layer and the actual physical hardware, uh, that it uses open protocols and supports multiple vendors. Not sure about the flow-based stuff, though. Although you will see that mm, some define that all forwarding decisions need to be made based on flows, or network flows. I'm not so sure about this one. Uh, and about centralized control. So the important thing to know is the, contr the control plane is logically centralized, not physically. This doesn't mean that there's a, a single controller out there, or that there's a box of controllers. It has to do with abstraction layer, so it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with how the control plane is implemented and where it's physically located. So this is the view, the comparison between conventional networks, the way that we do networking now, or the way that we did it before SDN came, and the software-defined network. Now, the idea is, in the conventional networking world, we have a dedicated device that's called a layer-to switch. We have a dedicated device that's a layer-free switch. We have a dedicated box called a firewall, and we have a router. We cannot use uh, a firewall as a load balancer, necessarily. So there are, there are dedicated devices with a dedicated piece of software, dedicated operating system, and they are, have limited uses. In the SDN world, we have switches, which can be programmed to be firewalls, routers, uh, load balancers, maybe something that you invent yourselves. And the idea is, so I can program any of these devices down there as a router, or as a firewall, or as a combination of them, whatever I want, using the network operating system or the control plane, without actually touching the CLI and the configuration of those switches. Now, historically, there's another problem that has been mentioned today. So is it the app's fault, or is it the network's fault? So what's your answer? It's always the app. Yeah. Uh, what happens when you have people writing apps for SDN, and you put the control of the network into their hands. How many bugs are there going to be? Who's going to troubleshoot those bugs? Who's going to maintain all of that? So we like our network stable. 
Are they going to remain like that after we converge to this? And uh, so the conventional world is there's the app developer saying it's all network's fault, and there's the network administrating saying, no, 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 it's the app. In SDN, it's like a, in, an interesting marriage. We need to talk. And these two guys, so the app developer and the network engineer will have to talk. But, so it, some people perceive SDN as it's going to end network engineering jobs. No. You just need to know how to talk to the software developer or become one. Uh, how many of you have heard OpenFlow equals SDN? OK. It's not true. Not essentially. Uh, OpenFlow is one of the interfaces that has been proposed as communication between the control and the forwarding plane. It's just one of the possibilities. It's not the only one. Uh, essentially, it's not an API, but it acts like one. And what it does, it, it manipulates the forwarding table on the switch. So basically, it says, move this packet here. Uh, send this packet back to the controller, drop this packet, or just, uh -huh, I don't know what to do, I'm just going to flood this packet to everything. So you can implement ARP as an application. Uh, of course, it needs to be supported on the switch. So uh, if you were thinking, OK, I'm just going to implement OpenFlow without having to replace my equipment, good luck with that. You will have to buy new equipment if you want to implement OpenFlow. And, uh, it requires applications to do anything useful. So if you buy your OpenV switch that supports OpenFlow, you buy a controller, you say, I'm ready to go, I'm going to run my network. Oops, there's no ARP. There's no firewall. There's nothing. It's just these switches that are programmable. So somebody needs to write those apps, or you need to buy them. So the transition can be costly. Um, the API between the top two layers is actually usually REST-based. It's not OpenFlow. So OpenFlow is only between the actual devices and the controller. And um, where are you going to get those applications? Who's going to write them? Who's going to support them? So ideally, it would be the um, IT department that requested this in the first place. But And the golden question, why don't we have OpenFlow on access points? First of all, there is OpenFlow on access points. There's a version of OpenWRT that you can use to turn your access point in uh, OpenWE switch. However, the current implementation of the OpenFlow protocol is pretty limited when it comes to funct functionality supported. Uh, there's also another thing. So how do switches, high-performing switches, uh, implement uh, lookups. How do they determine what needs to happen to a certain packet? Where to forward it? Hardware. They have cams, T cams, so everything is implemented in the hardware. Why? Speed. Yeah. And so are this. Why don't we have these T cams and cams everywhere in every switch? Why are some switches less? perform less than the others. Money. So the reality is, this comes at the price, the price of hardware. So the AP may not be the perfect location to put OpenFlow in, also because of performance issues that it, that could cause. We're still in the wild, wild west, so we haven't solved anything yet. And there is, to make things more complicated, so there are several flavors of SDN. Uh, any questions at this point, by the way? Does SDN equal OpenFlow? No. Really, it doesn't. Uh, there is no OpenFlow in the actual definition of what the SDN is, although you, will, you can read thousands of blogs thousands of uh, posts on Twitter, LinkedIn, saying OpenFlow is SDN. Those guys don't really understand SDN. There are several broader definitions. And if you come to OpenFlow and claim that's SDN, you have forgotten the original problem altogether. What was the original problem? 
make networks programmable, make services rolled out faster. One of the definitions is broker SDN. It means keep networks as they are, keep the existing control plane, but expose APIs to the software developers, which is what we are lacking today, right? So um, how many, how much network equipment do you, do you own that actually has a a programmable API? Usually it has a CLI and that's about it. No, why not? SNMP is pretty limited when it comes to write commands, right? So you have, SNMP is great for monitoring. Um, it does that job pretty well. But when it comes to quick changes in configuration, so first of all, uh, how complicated it is to read an SNMP MIB? <laughs> Usually it's pretty complicated. Um, the second is how many vendors actually support SNMP write commands? You do? Okay. Actually, some say SNMP with correct write support can be an SDM protocol. But it's a very loose definition. Yeah. Uh, so, broker SDN would be having a controller, a wireless controller that has whatever it uses for the control plane, cap, web, whatever, exposing APIs to the application developers. That's a broker SDN. Then you have overlay SDN, which basically says, let's keep everything the way it is, deploy a virtual network on top of that and treat that one as SDN and have virtual, virtual devices and program those, okay? That's called an overlay SDN. So let's keep everything as it is, it works. There are other approaches, like SNMP, uh, BGPLS, PCEP, NetConf. So actually, as a, a better alternative to SNMP, right, would be using NetConf, because uh, Yang is much more readable. So if you have a SNMP MIB and a Yang model, the Yang, not Yang model, but Yang model, that one's much more readable. But it does, it essentially, it does the same job. Uh, there's one more benefit of NetConf, it's transactional. So either everything is pushed to the network or it's rolled back, which is nice. What happens if uh, your SNMP script goes haywire? Oops, yeah, you start losing hair and you certainly quietly go out of the room and come back tomorrow. Um, OpenFlow and controllers. So OpenFlow has a controller. And we said that the most, so we won't, we're not gonna push OpenFlow on APs, we're gonna have, we'll probably use a broker SDN model. So we have our controller, which exposes an OpenFlow API, and then we have our controller configuring the network for us. What's the problem with this? There's already some delay here. Do you think, where do you think the SDN controller is going to sit, physically? In a data center, what happens when you have a distributed branch environment? In this case, it's management plane, yeah. So this doesn't sound like a, it works. There's actually implementation out there by Miru, um, but it has its costs. Because control, first of all, controls are mostly not on site. This is more like a management solution uh, which means the delays are going to be larger. Um, so, may not be the best way of doing things. But it's advertised as this. One of the good points of SDN is it enables vertical integration. It means you can now own most of your production chain, which for networking guys means there is no longer the need to have hardware, operating system, services and apps developed by the same vendor. You can take hardware from one vendor, take an operating system like, uh, you know about Cumulus Linux? Yeah, it's an uh, open networking operating system. You can, you can take that, use it as a network operating system, and then develop your own apps. Without having to rely for Mr. Vendor, please develop everything for me. 
It's like creating a Boeing airplane or Airbus airplane. So not all the parts are created at the same assembly line. They are created at different parts of the world, brought together and assembled. Uh, essentially, this is also how SDN works. What about the relationship, the close relationship between SDN and wireless? Uh, I believe the benefits are limited. If you think about SDN in a very narrow sort of way. So the WN management tools already provide centralized or pretty much centralized view of the network in terms of policy and management. Uh, when do the security policies change in Wi-Fi? How often? Every time? Yeah, yeah role-based. Every time I connect, maybe there's a change of authorization, but that's, more, that's all there is. So every time I connect a new device, there's a policy change or security change. That's it. That's not really dynamic. So the, the, this changes, this dynamics is pretty low. And for the multi-vendor part, uh, there has been several surveys saying that companies choose a single Wi-Fi vendor. So there is no need, there is no real need for that multi-vendor uh, Wi-Fi support, especially because the control plane, remember, in Wi-Fi is probably going to be, be, uh, remain untouched. And there's also limited vendor participation in programs like uh, ONF, Open Daylight, uh, with the actual open flow protocol. And the reason is, we would be reinventing the wheel. We already have such solutions in Wi-Fi. I have identified some use cases, though. Uh, we talked about QoS. Does QoS work 100% of the time? Why not? It's not end-to-end. -end. So there are your switches, there are your routers, there's them damn application server that won't support QoS. So how do we go about that? Uh, OpenFlow or SDN is one of the solutions. Uh, roaming optimization, especially over layer-free boundaries. We currently solve that by tunneling, either to the controller or back to the regional AP. So there are different implementations. Uh, SDN could solve this. And the third one is not really, it doesn't really require SDN as such. It just requires some open APIs. And it represents, I think, 90% of the cases that are out there that could benefit from this sort of thing. It's radio resource management. It's basically saying, this doesn't work for me. I want a different one. The QoS example. Let's say I have my app running on my device. And this app requires a certain QoS to function properly. That app, in this case, is Link. It could be anything else. Um, traditionally, we require end-to-end -end QoS on all our network infrastructure, wireless, uh, wired, for that device, for that certain application to work. In uh, SDN world, the application would request QoS from SDN controller, and the SDN controller would then adjust the flows across the network infrastructure to provide that bandwidth. So that would be solving the problem in a central point instead of relying on end-to-end -end QoS configuration. The second example is fast roaming. So when we roam across a layer-free boundary, today we're doing some sort of tunneling to keep the session intact. Ideally, so this is not, a, this is not an optimal network path, right? Ideally, the network path would also shift with the session. This is possible with the SDN controller. The issue, though, is how long does it take before the roaming notification comes to the controller and the controller reprograms the network? Yeah. If the, your controller is on site, it can take up to 1.5 seconds. Yeah. So. This, it is a good use case, but in reality, so in mission-critical enterprise networks, this probably isn't the solution. Not yet, anyway. And the case I like the most, there's actually some good research uh, done on slightly overlapping channels. Um, 
done by University of Catalonia. You know about it. Um, what they did is they created a feedback loop, which is missing from most of our, net, our networks. And that feedback loop monitored the uh, average throughput and number of retransmissions in the network and tried to establish the best channel selection, the optimal channel selection, uh, based on that data. And after they had that algorithm running for, I think, a couple of weeks, they, come up, they came up with a scheme that used all the channels. Obviously, the, 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 the four channels that were selected most of the time were 1, 5, 9, and 13, but they also used channel 2, channel 3, channel 4, and so on. And that's a great example of what you can do if you just expose those APIs. It would make this much simpler, and we could implement our own RRM algorithms. Some other examples come from mobile service provider industry, where they want you to consume more bandwidth. Why? Money. So. Uh, What's that feature on iOS, uh, Wi-Fi Assist? So that one tries to uh, steer you away from bad Wi-Fi, but basically it steers you on uh, mobile or cellular. Uh, what they came up is, let's use Wi-Fi, 3G and 4G radios, whatever you have on your device, aggregate that pipe and have you consume more data. They did this in uh, South Korea and Telecom did this or use them for load balancing. So some traffic on upstream traffic on um, 3G, downstream traffic on Wi-Fi. You could do that. There are even cases of using a software-defined radio where you can do your own OFDM carrier selection because in some environments it proves that's actually better. But this is a very niche market. So let's come back to our, our wild, wild west. There are only two guys standing now. It's probably not re worth replacing the current control plane of Wi-Fi, of Wi-Fi networks. Suppose, suppose they work. And if we are going to go the SDN way, it's probably going to be broker SDN anyway. Or we're, go we're just going to use the management plane, uh, uh, protocols like NetConf and Yang, and things like that. Um, it makes more sense exposing APIs than actually putting OpenFlow in there. I think 99% of our issues or the requests, I come from a vendor, so we have a lot of requests, would be, would be solvable by exposing a good API. And uh, you will hear a lot more about SDN. You will hear some different solutions. It's okay. If they solve a problem, we don't care. And um, where SDM will become really important is in network automation and orchestration across different network technologies. Switching, routing, Wi-Fi, so a combination of all of those, where you need a cent central point of management, configuration, single view of the network. That's where this becomes important. However, there may be niche cases outside the enterprise environment for OpenFlow. Where do we have problems with bad or non-existent control plane? Which kind of uh, Wi-Fi environment? In our homes. How uh, does anyone use more than one AP at home? OK, nice. How does roaming work? <laughs> um, how does channel selection work? Great. Static, yeah. So some of the... So, yeah, <laughs> some of the vendors, uh, the, the channel selection protocol on, on some of the vendor equipment is use channel five, and that's the protocol. So there is there is some cases out there that could benefit from this sort of thing, but it will probably need to be supported by your Comcasts, AT and T's, Deutsche Telekoms, and others. So what I think it's not really about software defined, as it's more about network programmability. Exposing a good set of working APIs, have them documented, put out some examples, some source codes, and you're ready to go. You're gonna solve 99% of your problems. So thank you for your attention. Um, any questions?
I'll, I'll start with the one since I have the mic, yeah. Uh, you, you are with a vendor, great. Do you see any vendor incorporating any form of SDNs that you described across vendor boundaries? Across multiple vendors. So uh, Meru had that point because they exposed OpenFlow, but they kept their own control plane. So I think the, the, the premise that people usually choose a single vendor is gonna stay. However, uh, you, they will choose different vendors for switching, for w routers and so on. So I think that's the extent this is gonna go. So do you see any vendor exposing their own APIs available for a customized RRM after they've spent man years of coding their RRM on their hardware? So we're gonna exp Airhive's gonna expose some APIs. Uh, they're also going to be used for configuration, and I don't see why not. But I don't see any one specifically exposing their RRM yet. A question back there? Extreme does. I have to, t to react, I think. Uh, um, on behalf of Extreme Networks, uh, they, their API is open. Okay. Probably because uh, we're a small vendor, flexible, and we have to. So we used to team with uh, guys like Big Switch, uh, F um, NAC, Open Daylight. So we don't, we use, didn't make uh, open flow controllers. Uh, we are going to launch probably this year an, our own OpenFlow controller. Uh, but since history uh, and the API was open, and you can just probably switch from the outside. So. Uh, when exposing APIs, uh, as you talk about, to your partners, to your customers, would this have any impact on support from your Definitely. perspective? Definitely. So that's why you usually don't want to expose everything at once. Plus, you want to have your APIs to really work. So it's not just saying, here's an API, use it, and then people come back and say, my requests are taking five minutes or I'm getting back garbled get data, so that's not the way to go. It, it actually, it's very important how the implementation is made, how the rollout is made, and also, so when somebody has a problem, where to go? Is there a forum for that? Is there an online community? Is there a documentation he can, they can read? Definitely. It might perhaps uh, awaken some new part of a vendor that assists their customers in using the API and supporting some certain solution sets just to develop features way faster and still make it uh, reliable and supported, maybe? Uh, I think what's gonna happen is, so the networking and the development world are sort of becoming more acquainted with each other, so they're, tr they're try starting to cooperate. This breeds uh, things like DevOps and things like that. And uh, I'm not sure the vendor is gonna take this on board, but there are going to be companies that will be developing services. Especially when those APIs are open, you can have a service for one vendor, another vendor, service for all the vendors, so it depends. Uh, but I'm f I think there is going to be many opportunities for these kind of companies to pop up. Hi, um, have you heard about SON? Self- Organizing some? networks? Yes, I've, I have uh, an article here. It's from um, Airtight Networks where they say that SON could be the next SDN for wireless because SON is already used in LTE. And we are converging to one market anyway, so what's your thought about that? So uh, an API or SDN can be enabler for Sun, but it's not the next SDN, if I understood the statement correctly. Well, so they, they define here that, well, they say that uh, Sun may be SDN made for wireless. Uh, because they do radio resource management and everything from uh, within the self-organizing network server. Well, the thing is, you can have a self-organizing network without exposing any open APIs. So you, you can stay closed, bundle it, bundle in, and close yourself to a single single infrastructure. So that's not it's not the same thing. It's com it's not comparing apples to apples. 
So you mentioned several times that customers prefer to stick to a single Wi-Fi vendor. Now, don't you think that this is exactly because Wi-Fi vendors keep everything 100% proprietary, so there is no way you can mix equipment? We tried to do cap wap we know where it ended, right? That was the pre-SDN for wireless. So don't you think if actually there will be some common open APIs, customers will be able to choose, for example, think, okay, I like access point from this vendor because it's small and it looks nice in my room here, but in outdoors I will use AP from another vendor because it has cool radius. So that would be the Goldilocks scenario, uh, which is not going to happen because we're doing business. Um, <laughs> but um, theoretically, theoretically it's possible. Um, there were ideas like this before. But I don't think that's going to fly. Plus, you know, like uh, Keith mentioned, there's been years of research and development in fine-tuning those control planes, which are proprietary. So... And then after years of research and development, some university with three interns does that, right? Expose APIs. 